All right, it's seven o'clock. I think we're going to go ahead and start. Welcome to everyone. Um, welcome to the Champaign County Master Gardeners Monthly Program. I'm Janet Townsend. I'm a member of the program committee. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce our guest pres presenter, Shane Cultra, co-owner of Country Arbors Nursery in Urbana. Country Arbors is owned and run by fourth and fifth generation nurserymen and ladies of the Cultra family. The original family nursery was founded in Anarga, Illinois in 1865. Terry and Donna Culture purchased and reestablished the nursery in Urbana, formerly known as Wandell's Nursery, and in 1988 renamed it Country Arbors Nursery. In the mid 90s, Terry's two sons, Shane and Joe, joined the family business to learn the trade and continue on the family tradition that continues to this day. The sixth generation is already working at the nursery on spring breaks and holidays, and they are looking forward to having new members join the business. Without further delay, here to answer all your garden side chat questions is Shane Coulter. All right, so I got a, uh, a list of questions, which pretty much looks like what I do every day. This, this is exactly what my email looks like every morning when I wake up. So uh, it'll be pretty easy to go through it. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, Rachel. And Rachel had a question, what's the best way to prevent squirrels from digging holes in your garden? Uh, it's actually the Master Gardener program that led us in the direction for exactly that. And it was a product called Plant Skid. It seems to be one of the few things that actually works on squirrels. There's other things that have listed it and said it. And we've had people come in and say this works or that works but there really hadn't been anything until the product called Plant Skid came around. And it comes in uh, granular form, it comes in spray form, and it's good for putting in the pots on your front porch or just things in the garden. And it seems to do a pretty good job uh, keeping the squirrels out. So that's something that we recommend when it comes to uh, keeping squirrels out. And that's about the only thing we have. They're pretty much the uh, hardest thing to keep out of your garden. That and deer have their own ways of doing things that nobody really understands. So that's uh, that would be my advice for the planting squirrel part. Um, all right, so we'll move on to Deborah's next question. Uh, she says she has an old dying hydrangea that was removed from her garden, but has many suckers that have come up and how to get rid of them. Uh, when it comes to hydrangeas, they're not a huge suckering uh, plant. It, it's not like a viburnum or another, an itea that seems to just keep rolling and going on forever and ever. It, it has a pretty defined base. Yeah, I can get wider and wider. But that one's just one you have to dig up. And I think you can dig up with, I wouldn't say ease, because it obviously depends on your physical skills. But of all the plants, it's really one of the easier ones to control. I don't think you need to use chemicals. I think just a sharp shovel. Every time you see a section, you just dig it up and throw it away. So I think a, a sharp shovel is the easiest way to get rid of that one because it, it doesn't, it's not aggressive and go all over the place. It's, it's uh, pretty, it's a slower growing with a defined edge to it. You just dig it up. All right. So you want me to just keep rolling through these questions? Yeah, sure. That You're doing great. Okay. All right. All right. Next question is, uh, I would love to grow a rosemary hedge. This is from Virginia. They're rated for zone seven. Any way to get them to last around here? Uh, no, the only way, I mean, they're, they're definitely worth having uh, and they're definitely uh, can be a year round plant, but that means bringing them inside. We tend to grow our rosemary, start them in spring, grow them outside, put them in the porch, uh, keep them on the dry side. We trim them into all different shapes, but one of the shapes we like to work them into, into the fall and winter is uh, kind of a Christmas tree shape. Cause what happens during then is you can bring that into the house and have a good Christmas ornament uh, that you bring inside and put it on the table. It smells great. You can use it for cooking. Uh, and it's got a Christmassy look because you've shaped it into a little triangle. So you'll see a lot of people, uh, a lot of garden centers actually bring them in in that shape just to sell them for Christmas. And uh, you don't have to though, because you can buy just a regular old one during the spring and shape it. 
not super expensive. A giant three gallon plant is probably twenty dollars. So it's uh, it's something you can do year round. It's not going to live in the ground. A uh, hint or trick that I do when it comes to tropicals or things that don't live here is I get a pot that's exactly the same size pot that I bought the plant in. And I'll dig a hole and put that pot in the ground and just slip the non-hardy stuff into it and mulch it in. So it looks like it's planted, but when winter comes, I just pull it out of the ground, fill that little pot with mulch so nobody steps in it and bring the plant inside. So that's, that's how I cheat. Uh, in my whole garden. And when you own a garden center, you, you want lots of different stuff in your yard. You want to always plant it. So I just slip them in. And so my yard looks, looks like it's got different plants every year, but I'm just cheating and borrowing plants from the nursery. And rosemary is definitely one of them you want to have. All right. So Kay's got another question. When's the best tr time to plant, uh, transplant hellebore uh, or ginger arum? And I would say, realistically, there's a couple times that are the best. You know, either one you can plant if you get a big enough shovel full with, with soil. You know, if you, if you can take a big shovel full of anything, you almost can move it any time because it doesn't know it's being moved. That being said, we will trans, uh, we'll transplant them or pot them up or dig them up uh, August when they're dormant and not really doing anything or in usually in March. Hellebore is a little different in the fact that it blooms in the winter and it's a little bit more active than your normal perennial, but we still transplant them quite a bit in March, like the first week in March up to the third week in March. Either one of those are transplant really easy during those periods of time. But when they go dormant, we start to move stuff around a little bit when it comes to August, September. And you're gonna see a lot more hellebores coming out they're starting to get a little cheaper, not real cheap yet. They're still a $20 plant, but you're seeing lots of new colors. Even we're at the nursery, brought out three or four more colors this uh, coming week. You'll see some more. Uh, this is a good one. What's your favorite overlooked perennials that uh, are attractive, mid-sized bushes, flower, interesting foliage, um, something in the background? So there's a lot of questions there. It's, it is hard to say. The overlooked perennials, um, the one nice thing about country arbors is most of our perennials don't get overlooked. People seem to have their favorite and it's amazing all the different flowers that people think are the best. Um, my favorite is definitely like an autumn charm sedum. It's a variegated sedum. The foliage is amazing. I could drop it off the back of the truck and it land in the ditch and it probably would still grow has beautiful uh, pink flowers in the fall, but against that mulch, uh, it really shines with a, a variegated foliage. And I have a couple of them around my house. Uh, Allium is my other favorite. I just think Allium is just the perfect perennial. The foliage is twisty and hardy, doesn't get bugs, doesn't get holes in it, doesn't get any diseases on it. And then it flowers a good long time with those beautiful purple blooms. It's not really overlooked. You're seeing more and more of it, but it's, I've had mine for 15 years and I, it's my favorite perennial in general. Just, it's a can't miss, really tough to kill. I don't think I've ever heard anybody killing their allium. Um, so I think it's a really good plant. And also you're finding that we're, it's in one gallon container. So if you forgot to plant it in the fall before, you don't have to worry about it anymore. They're all planted in one gallon container. So you can just pick them up at your local garden center and plant them anytime. Uh, Mid-sized bushes are flowering, interesting foliage. Um, I've always been a big fan of uh, ivory halo dogwood. It's a little tough for some people because it gets spotty and I've found that most people can't take foliage that looks bad. It drives them crazy. I don't know if today's society is OCD or everybody wants everything perfect, but it'll get a little black spot here and there, but the foliage is really pretty. The new growth um, comes on quickly. It responds to trimming, uh, gets some decent uh, red twigs during the winter. And, and the key to keeping your stuff spotless is to let the leaves dry before night. So don't water at night. Don't water after four o'clock. Uh, water in the morning or water uh, and give it enough time to dry off before the season. We, we tend to not run sprinklers on that plant. Everything else at the nursery, we probably put too many sprinklers on, but that one's one we hand water or make sure that the sprinklers go off uh, before four o'clock. 
um, background plants, Bailey dogwood. As I talked about dogwood, it's a really good, can't miss a hedge, great winter interest, thick enough you can't see through it. Um, you have to trim out some dead every once in a while, but it gets super thick as a hedge, super easy to grow, hardly any problems with the plant. So that's one of my favorite backdrops. I also like a viburnum called Cardinal Candy. It's got some really pretty uh, fruit to it. It uh, really grows a heavy fruit. The birds love it. The birds love to nest in it. It's thick, only gets six to seven feet tall. And uh, it's a, a real strong shower. You'll, you'll find that one of the things I like are, you know, everybody comes into the nursery and asks for the same thing. Everybody wants low maintenance plants. Um, they want something that blooms all season. They want it to be three feet tall and they don't want it to cost a lot. So that seems to be everybody's favorite plant. So we try and guide them somewhere in that direction when it comes to plants. Uh, okay, next one, Kara. Uh, Kara, I would love suggestions on native ground cover to replace grass in a shady depart shade yard. Um, that is a tough one. There's, you know, the ones that, that do the best are ones that probably aren't native, your vincas, your uh, Pakistandra, your English ivy. Again, that's all stuff that, you know, it's not really native, but that seems to be the most popular, easy to grow. That's what University of Illinois uses everywhere. I prefer things like lamium. I just do a combination and fill it with uh, lamium and coral bells and a still, be I just use shade plants that take up space and just try and draw the eye all over the garden uh, throughout that shade area so that it doesn't look like an open spot. Yeah, you're gonna have to mulch it, um, but you get enough plants in there, half yard of mulch will cover a huge area when you have a lot of great flowers in there. So that's, the, that's what I try and do when it comes to a shade area rather than having one. Uh, Liripe spicata will grow in full sun but I find that it actually does pretty well in shade unless you have a ton of tree roots and then there's just not enough water to grow it in there. But I, you know, again, I'm a big lamium fan, uh, lammy astrum. I use quite a bit of, and I have a tree that it will eat any amount of water it can find. Even the pots in my, underneath that tree, it will grow roots and send it up through the bottom of the pot uh, and, eat all the water, drink all the water in that pot and take it away from even whatever I plan the pots. I've had to seal it up with silicone to keep roots from growing up in the pot. So um, yeah, you just have to get really super hardy things like lamiastrum to take over that. And, and of course there's hosta and helleborus and all the common things in there as well. Um, you know, just again, a good mix of shade plants are what I would use. Everybody still there? <laughs> Yeah, Still there. Great. Uh, <laughs> Great. <laughs> all right. Okay. So the next question is from Jane. Is it uh, possible to grow vanilla bean in my home garden? Um, that I don't know. I haven't. That's the one thing I've never grown vanilla bean. So I don't know if you can grow it or not. I, I assume no, because I would have heard about it and people talk about it, but that doesn't mean anything because there are obviously things that I don't know. <laughs> I don't ever claim to know everything, but it's not something that's come up before. So I'm going to say that uh, you probably could grow it, but it, it probably is a little bit more difficult to do. Uh, identify mold on begonias. We don't get a lot of mold on begonias. We do get a lot of root rot. If you overwater your begonias, uh, we do get kind of a, um, Oh, it turns to kind of like an old lettuce if you get your begonias a little bit too much moldy. Uh, the white dusty mold, it probably could be powdery mildew. That just means you have a super wet spot, a super, um, you know, air doesn't move very well, it, which is pretty tough on most begonias. Most begonias just don't have too much problem with it, but I assume that you're having a shady, a shady spot where air just doesn't move and it tends to hold a little water. So on that, I would just think you got to open up the area a little bit, somehow uh, maybe make the soil a little bit more porous and just get a better, lighter mix of what you're planting your, uh, 
your begonias in because again that's not generally a problem that we have there are plenty of plants that get powdery mildew and white dusty uh, mold but begonias you really have to work at it to get that so that's um and how do you spot it you you can see it it's on the tips of the leaves it's on the leaves uh it's it's a pretty easy one to see okay we're going to go to beverly she has a, a question when a flower, peony, iris, or tulip finish blooming, do you recommend cutting, cutting off spent blooms? Um, and then a second question, hybrid plants, cone flowers have less chance to return than native. Okay, when it comes to peony, iris, and tulip, we let them uh, finish out the foliage, but we do cut off the flower. So when the flower is unsightly, we tend to cut that off. There's no sense in letting the plant or using energy for these spent blooms when they can concentrate on putting more energy back into the bulb and back into the foliage. And the foliage is what gives the energy to the bulb. So don't cut off your, your uh, tulip leaves. Don't cut off your iris leaves. Just cut off the flower. And I literally just cut them off all the way to the where they start and get rid of them. My peonies seem to stay pretty good, but I don't have my peonies uh, put in very tight into the bed. They're pretty open. So they breathe pretty well and the foliage lasts a long time for me. Um, there's going to be a question later about fertilizing to make a stronger peony so you don't have to uh, put a cage around it. That's where you have to be a little careful. Too much fertilizer will make it stretch and it actually is the opposite. If it grows too fast, it becomes lanky and falls over. So you kind of have to watch how much fertilizer you put on it to make sure it stays a strong growth, but not too much growth, not too much nitrogen, a balanced growth. Uh, food for peony. I, I still use plain old Osmocote on my peonies and it seemed to be pretty balanced and heat released. And when it's heat released, peonies don't start getting real floppy till later and the heat release fertilizers don't start putting on heavy nitrogen till usually June when we start getting some uh, heavier temperatures. Slow release fertilizers generally aren't uh, released through water, it's heat. Most people think it every time you water, it releases some fertilizer, that's not the case. It actually releases with heat. But yeah, we trim them off when they're done blooming, clean them up. Hybrid plants, cone flowers, undoubtedly they don't come back as well as some of the natives. And a lot of the natives, or the native will also spread through seed. So the new ones are meant to not spread through seed, although they will in some cases. They're meant to spread, uh, to spread through rhizomes and spread through the uh, plant roots themselves. The key to that is what you're not gonna like and that's to get rid of the flowers. When you get a new plant, enjoy a flower or two, but get rid of the flowers. The flowers take up so much energy, the plant doesn't really grow wide. To get through a winter on a, a new cone flower, you got it. it has to go the end of the year, the size of your fist. It has to be a big plant. If you go to a garden center and, and we're guilty of it too, and you see this little plant with this big tall flower, they want you to buy it because of the flower. That's why you buy plants. So they, and we, again, I should use the word we, we do the same thing. Um, they want you to see how pretty it is and you will buy the plant because it's pretty. But the reality is my grandmother told me this, when you get new plants, you should take all the flowers off of it. The flowers take up all the energy and you want the plant to concentrate on its root. So when you plant it, you trim up the flowers, it will flower again. Um, so you just take them off and just get that root system going and going and going, and then you'll be able to enjoy the flowers, uh, at that later in the summer and especially next year. So get rid of the, the power suckers, the uh, flowers that take all the energy away and you have a much better chance, but they are improving, greatly improving. Come flowers over the last three years have become so much better when the first colors, the oranges and reds came out. They did not survive real well. And we're seeing much, much better varieties this year. Um, Pam, this is the question of the year. Are trees in general suffering? Our magnolias dropped a lot of leaves. Our crab apple has more dead branches than usual. I would say tree disease and tree dead branches is probably 10 times more than I've ever seen since I've been doing this. Every tree that wasn't established uh, looks rough. Any, you're seeing every stressful situation. If a tree was in the basement clay of Savoy or in the new home of Muhammad, 
they implanted in the last year or two, they look rough. Uh, they are not doing very well. Older trees took a lot of winter kill. Why? You know, I don't have a complete answer. Wet spring is a huge answer, but also over the winter, we didn't get a, we didn't get the ground to freeze. So nothing went completely dormant. So things sat in water. Uh, things didn't go completely to sleep. And that's not a good thing when you're facing some winter weather. So I, I think that was the culmination of everything coming together. Every tip on maples looks pretty rough. You're seeing anthracnos, you're seeing oaks with little leaves, you're seeing every columnar oak with a tip dot top dying out on it. Um, it's a bad year to be in the warranty business of trees. It's also tough for the emails. I, I get over 400 emails every day of different things, um, just like these questions. Some good, some bad. A lot of pictures that I get to see on these. Okay, Dixie has a question. What small sized hydrangea does he most recommend? Uh, there's a couple. I love hydrangeas. It's probably my favorite flower. I just, uh, I love them. I have great success with them. I get them to bloom every time. Uh, but I'd say that the one that's growing on me this year is called Wedding Gown. It's just a beautiful white. It's really pretty small. The flower has a lot of texture to it. It's not round. It's not pointy like a paniculata. Um, it just has layers to it. And you, you all can Google it, but yeah, it's called Wedding Gown. It's a really pretty one. Uh, one that I like because I like the fall color is a uh, tiny tough stuff. It's called a mountain hydrangea. Its flowers are pretty, nothing too extravagant, but it gets a good red fall color that uh, most hydrangeas don't get. Uh, it is pretty tough. It can get a little bit lanky on a bad winter when it comes back up in the spring, but it's, uh, it's a really nice one, tiny, tough stuff. Um, the reds of hydrangeas right now, there's some macrophyllas that turn a red color that are breathtaking. I mean, it's absolutely stunning. Uh, magical Ruby red is one I put in the newsletter that, uh, a lot of people came out to see thinking that my photo would, was kind of altered. And when they saw it, they, the color I took was the color it is. So magical ruby reds, probably the newest color that's shocking. And they're always coming out with new colors and new, new names. One of the things you're seeing in the industry is people are tired of paying proven winter prices. Uh, as a grower, it's, it's crazy how expensive they are and how much it costs to produce. And so you're seeing a lot of people go away and form their own thing, and many of them are similar to what's out in Proven Winter. Some of them are different. You gotta let us garden centers decide what's the same and what's different. Um, but there's a lot of great hydrangeas out there right now. Uh, Kathy asks, what plant do you need to grow and is easy or worth the effort? The I have to grow blank every year. For me, it's canna. Uh, I like can of plants again they're super easy to grow you dig them up you get to do it again <clears throat> the colors are easy and they fill a spot <clears throat> excuse me as well as any plant out there um so i love my my canna same with elephant ear you will always see an elephant ear in my yard i just if i could get one to get leaves as big as me that's what i'm shooting for i i vacation in hawaii every year their botanical gardens are just filled with native elephant ears. And I want the whole botanical garden in my yard. I just really like that look. Um, they're just beautiful, especially if you can get a big giant black leafed elephant ear. That's me. So I, I, that's something that I, I really like, and I'm always looking for new ones. And every year they come out with a leaf that's bigger than the last year's leaf. And, and so they're really fun to grow. Of course, I can't get them as big because I live in Stone Creek, which our soil is not the greatest. I've done the best I can, it's, but it's definitely not Hawaiian rich uh, soil and shade. Uh, next question from, I'm going to butcher the name line. It says she has a crab tree with branches hanging too low. Some of them as thick as two inches. Can part of the branch be pruned or a whole branch removed? Uh, absolutely. You can do it. That's what tree trimming is all about is trimming from the bottom up, uh, is pretty easy. A lot of people have to do it for mowing. It's better to do it when it's younger, but, 
what we have to do is wait for the right timing. So we don't want to trim that when the sap is pumping hard. Uh, the, we do a lot of it uh, early, like in February, beginning of March. We'll do it now when the trees are dormant. So the trees are pretty dormant now. Um, we dig uh, a little off the topic here, but we dig evergreens right now too, for the same reason. You'll start seeing us dig arborvitaes and pines and spruce because they're dormant and trees are essentially the same way, the heat and everything's got them kind of sitting there. When you trim it, um, trim it a little off the trunk. Don't go flush with the trunk or you'll get a nice scar. So trim it about quarter inch off the trunk. Um, no paint, no black paint. It's like putting butter on a burn. Don't put any tar or anything. The tree will naturally heal itself up. So just let the sap do its job and seal that tree and you will be able to get underneath it. Okay, now we're going to Lee. Uh, what's the best way to get blueberry plants established in a high pH soil? Well, if you're, uh, the one thing you don't want is aluminum sulfate. Do not put aluminum sulfate. Blueberries are toxic, or aluminum sulfate is toxic to blueberries. So we want to go with ammonium sulfate. When I go with ammonium, I put it in a little hot water, pour it on the plant, and try and get the pH down on that. When I sell somebody a blueberry, I tell them three things. I tell them they want sandy soil. The rabbits love them more than any plant in the entire garden. It's their favorite plant. So keep the rabbits off of it and use ammonium, ammonium sulfate to get that pH down. Um, if you got well water, try not to use well water. Try and use something the rain that you caught with the rain. <clears throat> something uh, well water is very high in pH. So don't make it worse by using that kind of uh, water. Rainwater works really well on it. But that's the key to blueberries. They like that. There's a reason they grow in Michigan so well. Those are the conditions they have. <clears throat> All right. The next one is from Jane, the best location for service berry, the best native urban shade trees. Service berry like dry. <clears throat> they like, uh, they really want to be in an area that's not wet. If you'll notice when a service berry is struggling in the yard, it tends to be a wet spring. So if you're going to, if you're going to put a service berry, you don't want to put it by the downspout on the corner, or you want to move that downspout off the corner. Um, now that's not saying they want it bone dry. They just don't want to sit in water. And the kind of spring we had this year was not the kind of spring that, that service berries want to have. I also find that service berries do like a little bit of shade. So if you can get maybe a little break from the afternoon sun, um, the service berry will do a little better. And I was explaining this to someone today on what a, how a plant will grow in difference in heights, because everybody seems to want to treat their plants the same. But let's say you planted a plant along your house in the morning it's shade, in the middle of the day it gets a break from the sun, and the right side is full sun. The plant in the middle is going to be the tallest. The plant on the left will be the shortest and the plant in the full sun will be medium. And the reason is plants can get kind of stressed out with tons of sun. If you give them a little break from the sun, they get plenty of sun, but get a little break from, from it at some point, they will actually grow a little taller because they won't dry out as fast, but still get the sun they need. The shade, plants need sun to grow. So the more sun or lack of sun, they'll tend to be a little smaller. And then again, the full sun will will do fine, but it'll be just a little bit more stress than the one that gets a break. So service berries, that's what I try and do. I don't want to put them in shade, but I'll put them in the, you know, if you cut out a, a forest and cut out a road, it likes that area. Um, but it will take full sun without a doubt. It still will do just fine. Best native urban shade tree. Again, that's everybody's personal choice. Mine's an English oak. Um, people hate English oak because it gets powdery mildew, can have a little dead in it during the winters. I like it because there is no more tree. There is no tree in Illinois that has more things for the birds. There's a like 300 different bugs. I can't remember what talk I went to, but I went to a talk on what trees are best for habitat as far as pests. English oak has more pests than any other tree, but which is perfect for birds and wildlife. That's what they want. That's what I have in my backyard. It's an amazing tree. It's grown fast. Yeah, it gets a little powdery mildew. I don't care. 
it doesn't bother me a bit. Powdery mildew doesn't get on me. It doesn't affect the health of the tree. Um, birds love it. Got squirrels, millions of birds. It's really a nice tree. Um, so I, I, I like my English oak. Uh, obviously service berries been really good to Illinois too. That's an, a really nice one to get the fruit, the flowers and the fall color. That's, uh, that's one of my favorite, but again, it just struggles a little bit in these basement clay homes. Uh, we have a lot of customers that struggle with it. All right, Betty. Betty has the best way to get rid of yard violets. I don't know of any other way, but over the top weed killer. Uh, again, I'm not a huge chemical guy, but when it comes to uh, creeping Charlie and wild violets, I just got to go ortho with the purple cap or purple, purple label. I just go over the top and kill it. I just, uh, when it comes to your yard in the bed, I'm, uh, again, I don't like using a lot of Roundup. Uh, Roundup kills my bees. So, um, and people ask, well, how does it kill your bees? They think it's water. So if you spray Roundup at the wrong time, the bees will drink it just like water. And that's from a guy that has hives that's watched it. So, um, but I still use it every once in a while. But, but when it comes to violets are in my bed, get a paintbrush. I tape it to a stick, I dip the paintbrush into the Roundup and I paint the little things like violets that are growing in my bed and make it a little bit more uh, exact when it comes to killing plants. Uh, well, fertilizing peonies help stand them up better. I kind of addressed that earlier. Just be careful not too much nitrogen. You don't want to stretch them out. How and when to look for virus X on friends hosta before accepting. You just got to know what it looks like. I remember when virus X came out, every hosta had virus X. It didn't matter what the disease, they were calling it virus X and killing the plant because everybody was so scared. Uh, you just have to know what the streaking looks like. Um, if you don't touch them, it's not going to spread. But if you're cutting them and using scissors and touching other plants, and it, yes, it's going to spread to your other hosta. So you have to be careful. That's just, you got to find someone that knows what they're looking for. Uh, Googling kind of helps. It's just a streak that after you've done, be all, dealt with it a while, you're going to know what that looks like. Um, and certain plants get it. Some in substance hosta is notorious for getting, there's certain varieties that get it much more than others. So just, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to, to tell you in this kind of talk what to look for. Um, how to tell when plants can be removed manually and which ones simply result in spreading the plant further than eliminating it. For us, it's the way they grow. Um, for one, if you see it in a pot at a garden center and the plant is pushing against the side, rather than a clump, it's actually growing. You can see when you take it out, you can actually see the rhizomes from the side of the pot. You're pretty assured that that's gonna be a spreader um, by the way it's growing in the pot. In your garden, I usually put my hand down in there and if you can feel a center piece, then you know it's growing from the center. If you can feel that there's all kinds of uh, new plants and roots coming from all over the entire plant, it's probably a spreader. So for instance, like on a creeping phlox, it looks like it spreads, but if you were to trace that plant back, you would see it all comes from a center piece. So it's not gonna be invasive. Um, there's lots of different plants that if you just do that and see how it grows, does it all start from one center and then kind of fall over and make that plant? Or is it uh, roots that have spread out? And I just use my fingers and check that out. I mean, I know the plants by now, so I don't have to do that as much, but in general, that's how you're gonna be able to tell. Um, now we'll go to Barbara. What shrubs are most attractive to butterflies and other pollinators? Uh, I have a space for those that would prefer full sun as well as semi-shade. So uh, most people know the obvious, the cone flowers and the butterfly bushes and the agastache. But the key is the things that um, are growing in the summer. Think about when butterflies here are here and think about things that are in bloom during that time period. Uh, I think one of the biggest problems with most garden gardeners, just your average people, they only come in spring. They only buy things that are in bloom and then they only come in the spring. They don't ever get a chance to go see all the beautiful plants that are blooming 
in the middle of summer. Uh, plants that bloom in spring sell two to one versus plants that bloom in summer. And that's a shame because the butterflies aren't even around uh, and the bees aren't nearly as active during those earlier months. So going into a garden center now, coming out to country arbors now, this is the time you want to start hunting. Things that are in bloom you didn't know about, plants you hadn't seen before, um, seeing if they're still in bloom from the last time you went there. Do you, you can do homework by going to garden centers and noting when things are in bloom, but it's got to be a garden center that doesn't force their blooms. You can't go to Lowe's, Menards. Those things are forced, come from North Carolina, come from a state that may have different temperatures. Um, you got to go to a garden center that doesn't ship them in, that grows them there. So you can see based on the weather and you live in, uh, what is that plant doing? And that's how oh, the best, the people have a list of 10 pollinators. There's, the list of pollinators is hundreds deep um, for, for butterflies. As far as what like they like to eat, no, there's definitely Asclepias tuberosa. I mean, that's a go-to plant when it comes to uh, the caterpillars eating. And there's no doubt that they love butterfly bushes. But again, as I said earlier, Agastache, loaded with butterflies. Caryopteris, absolutely loaded with butterflies. Uh, you can, again, come out to the nurseries. The butterflies will guide you to what they like. I don't have to give you a list. Just come see where they go. They'll tell you the answer to that question. What do we got here? What's the best? Okay, we'll go to Kathy's question. Uh, what is the best time to start an iris bed? What are some of the varieties that are easy to grow? And what are growing tips for growing iris? It's really, really simple. So the key as far as, as far as, buying iris is if they're in one gallon pots, you can plant them anytime. If it's something that you want to get bare root rhizomes, August is easily the best time, August, September. That's when we start ours. That's when we dig ours up or buy our starts is in August. We plant them for next year. So if you're doing it that way, you definitely want to start in August. If they're in one gallon containers, they've already gone through that process of finding the right time to plant them. You're planting a whole giant pot so you can plant them anytime. They're, they're really easy to grow. You just got to keep them on the dry side. If you go into our garden center, you're going to see pink flags in it. It's to keep the, the maintenance people from watering them too much. They don't need much water and they don't need the same amount of water as other perennials, most other perennials. So our pink flags mean lay off this plant. So that's the key to an iris. They do like a little bit of fertilizer, not heavy feeders, but good little fertilizer will help them bloom. Um, having a, you don't, I always say if the, if the patch of iris is bigger than you can hug, you probably want to thin them out and separate them a little bit. Once they start getting too big, then they don't bloom quite as well. But as far as one versus another, I like the re-blooming ones. Immortality is a really nice one that I like, but blooming, re-blooming doesn't mean it's going to bloom just voraciously the second go round. But it does mean if the weather sets up correctly, you'll get some summer blooms off your iris as well. And for centuries, there's been so many different colors. And, and there are new colors coming out, but I would say that peonies and iris are probably the two that the same hundred varieties and types have been around for 40 years. They're just so good that they're hard to improve upon. Yes, there'll be different color be beards and different color combinations, but they're what you what you have is pretty much what you're going to have for a while. They they've covered almost every color. There hasn't been too many where I go, wow, that's that's completely different. That being said, there's amazing colors. There's some Carolina blues out there that are the most beautiful blue. Just a matter of um, you know finding one that you like. We have one. And I can't remember the name of it, um, where it is so green that it looks black. Raven, I think it's called. Um, it's kind of an expensive one, but it was, again, super, super green and it looks black. But when the sun hits it, you realize that it was a dark green color. And that one's, that one's pretty good. I don't know if we have it for sale, but I know I have it in my backyard. But I think I paid $50 for one little root. Um, so iris are, are definitely easy to grow. And again, plant them anytime. All right, Stephen has a good question. Um, do you have a nice garden at home? Or are you the proverbial plumber whose own pipes leak? My pipes don't leak. 
but my garden could be a lot better. For a guy that owns a garden center, you'd think my yard is spectacular. That being said, my bones are strong. Um, I've got really nice hardscapes and I've got some great edges. So I have uh, that huge English oak in back that's, you know, I've lived in my house 14 years, but the tree is so big because I moved it in with a 90 inch tree spade and hand chose it from my own nursery. It takes up in my entire backyard and I have a 600 square foot patio. I haven't landscaped my yard in 14 years, but um, it's still it's still pretty. Uh, I took a picture of it in the newsletter. I've got a pond that pours out of a wall. I've just I've got really really good bones, and someday I'll actually put some makeup on it and make it look pretty. But it's it's not too bad. I'm sure I could fake it if if you guys ever had to come over. I'm sure I could have it looking pretty good in uh, a couple days because I know where to go to to find some good plants to fill all the holes. Right now I filled it with mulch because God fills holes and I'd rather fill it with my mulch than his weeds. All right, so it's decent. And I could I take some good pictures, some good angles, so it looks really good. Um, tip for having a four season flower bed. That, that's, a, that's a great question. It's one I give talks on all the time. Winter's our longest season. Uh, people forget that. You know, I, when people design landscapes uh, on commercial, it drives me crazy. They don't think about snow removal. You know, they design these, you know, I go to a bank or I go to a store and I think, where do they expect me to put the snow? Like, do they plan for the fourth season at all? They don't. Uh, for your home, you know, it's, we're really talking usually November, December, January, February, almost March. So four to five months, it's definitely a third of the year, you know, coming close to half where there's not plants if you don't do it right. So you've got to put in texture and height and colored twigs. That's why you heard me say red twig dog with Bailey. I sell those. I cut that down and bunch them up and sell them to you for $10 a branch. You could have that in your own backyard. Um, it's a really important part of your landscape. What are you looking at during the winter? And it can be as simple as catching snow. Carlisa viburnum, everybody grows because it's got the beautiful uh, fragrant flowers in the spring. I grow it because the branching structure catches the snow and the birds love to sit in it. That's why I grow it. I love the way it looks when it catches the snow. Um, it's just a matter of some, you know, evergreens. I like, I, in my backyard, I have a six foot Frankie boy. <clears throat> now that's a 15 year old plant, but it's gorgeous. It's six feet tall, four feet wide and a fluffy yellow that's yellow all year round. And again, catches the snow and is gorgeous. Um, I have that big tree in the back. I have, um, hardscapes that are there. I have some boxwood. Um, I just, I've set mine up. So when I look out the backyard, there's a pond that's still moving. It's big enough that the pond can keep going all winter. There's walls that catch the snow. There's evergreens. There's, uh, there's red and colorful foliage. That's the most important to me. I, flowers are easy. I can find flowers anywhere. Um, all the rest of the stuff, spring flowers are easy. Summer flowers are easy. Fall colors are easy. Winter takes some thought and you've got to mix that into your garden. So I think that's a great question. Four seasons. Don't forget about the fourth season. Um, and Boo Lin has a question. What type of plants can grow in direct sun that deer won't eat? Uh, what can go in the shade that deer won't eat? Basically what they're saying is what the deer won't eat. You guys have to help me with this one. I, I have no idea anymore. Idea anymore. She also asked any suggestion for shade vegetables. Those are, those are probably the three toughest questions that I get. I have no idea. You know, I can tell you that deer don't like heavily textured plants for the most part, um, leather leaf viburnum. But I mean, I saw deer eating marigolds this year. I mean, they hate marigolds. They hate the taste of them. Um, you know, it's just, I, I really don't have an answer. I'm sure there's lots excuse me, lots of people that can tell you things that they have had success with, but I have yet to compile a list that I didn't have somebody come back and say, yeah, that worked great. They ate every single bit of that. Um, so I don't have 
a, a great answer for that. I've given up. How about that? That's terrible, but I've given up when it comes to deer. And I welcome anybody that gives me an idea of something that's done really well. And I'll put it in my notebook and then see if the next person uh, puts a big X through it. Uh, Lauren, thank you for not asking a question. <laughs> I don't know if I have any wisdom, but I have experience. So let's, let's say that. Okay, Katie, uh, three big maple trees, I believe have gall mites. And what can she do for that? dead leaves. Um, let's start with that one. Uh, the red bumps that you've seen all over your maples are definitely uh, maple galls or gall mites. It, it's really almost impossible to treat. The mite treatment season for those particular are literally within days. Uh, you just can't time it right. I've never seen anybody that does a great job treating that. And you just kind of have to live with it. And when you get a wet spring like you have this year, it's as bad as I've seen ever this year. But again, you have to remember, it doesn't really even stress the tree. That tree has already conquered it through the little galls. It just covered up the mite. It's already fought. Uh, it just looks ugly and the wet springs made it as bad as it gets. So, hey, nobody wants to tell you to just live with something. But in that case, I think it's just live with it because timing that mite and spraying for mites during that is, is really a tough. Uh, doesn't look good missing leaves. Maples had a lot of dead in them this year. Uh, my linden's 40 years old. You guys park under it in the nursery. I get usually tons of compliments about what a great tree it is. The whole east side of it has a foot of dead on the entire tree first time in 40 years and you know again it's just how the season set up and i you would think i could trim it but my gosh there's probably 400 branches with it dead on it so i'm not sure what i'm gonna do yet uh, and i do this for a living and i'm still upset about it uh, she also asked about in her neighborhood, uh, no, she liked to encourage butterflies to visit and mostly shared it, shade areas to get some afternoon sun. Afternoon sun's as good as full sun. That's, if you're getting it from uh, any time after 11, after one, that's the hottest day sun. You can grow any butterfly plant you want in that area. So you're off to the races when it comes to butterflies. What evergreen shrubs, oh, this is from Amy. What evergreen shrubs do you recommend for the north? side of the house that receives no direct sun, so soil that stays moist and relatively wet during the winter, uh, need less than six feet. Okay, evergreens are going to hate that soil. I can tell you right now, they don't like wet feet. That's the one thing that evergreens, they're great. Like there's an, a relatively new yew called Everlow yew, only gets about three feet tall, four or five feet wide. Same with Totani yew. I love the two use. I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to use. I know that every person in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s had them and everybody in the 90s and 2000s tore them out, but you can't kill them. They are easy to trim and they fill, they're just beautiful green, but they don't like wet feet. So that's not going to be something that, that we do. Boxwoods are great, but we all have this winter kill problem that can happen with boxwoods as well. Um, they don't mind the wet feet. That's not a huge problem as long as it's not just soaking wet. But um, we also have a blight that can be a problem. It's, it's slowly coming here. Uh, there are new blight resistant boxwoods that are coming out uh, over the next couple of years. There's a, a new one this year. So I think you're gonna see some things that fight the blight a little bit better. Um, but again, that's something you have to watch out for. Ilex glabra is another one. The problem for me on Ilex glabra was the bottom tended to limb up a little bit so it wasn't full like a boxwood. But you're seeing some new, um, I'm not sure exactly what they're calling it, like, but they're boxwood replacers of Ilex glabra. And they do stay pretty full to the ground. So Ilex glabra is a, a really nice one to look forward forward to when it comes to something evergreen. Holly will like that. Holly, they die when they get too dry. So you probably have a situation where the holly would do just fine there. I highly recommend spraying wilt proof on your holly during the winter. Puts a wax over it, anti-desiccant, keeps it from drying out during the winter. So those are some things I think would be in that range. Holly gonna get a little bit bigger, but they trim super well. 
Okay, Wanda, please share all you know about Tricolor Beach, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I can do that because I've uh, grown a lot of Tricolor Beach. The good, there is no leaf color and pattern that's uh, got that red and pink in it like a Tricolor Beach. It's absolutely spectacular. Um, everybody wants to have a leaf like that. But the downsides is they can get quite large over time, super slow growing. That's another downside. It's uh, you're not planting it for you. You're planting it for your children, maybe your grandchildren, um, but they are worth planting. They also need a little bit of shade, which is for a tree that can get 60, 70, 80 feet tall. Eventually you think, why can it not take sun? Well, they get the best color. Uh, a little break from the sun gives you a lot of uh, be a lot better color in the leaf. Now I planted one that was spectacular. I planted against my house and a, I espaliered it. So I had this blank side of my house next to my neighbors that we didn't really have very many windows. So I planted a tricolor beach and had it going vertical, just like an apple tree, thinking that it would be so slow growing that, um, I could continue to keep it small and trim it up. So the good news was it was on the east side. So the color of the leaves was absolutely amazing. Um, also it was good that it grew kind of slow, but the bad was time goes quickly and it got big over a decade and got so big. I thought it was going to tear down the side of my house. So I actually had to tear down the tree, but I got to experience how fast it can grow, how beautiful the tree is. Um, and I hated tearing it down, but I, I literally had it planted against my house and one of the few mistakes that I made, but it's a tree worth having. There's some on University Avenue and some of the state streets and uh, Champaign and Urbana that makes you want to buy the house just for the trees because they're so pretty. There's not many trees in this world that makes you want to buy a house just for the tree that's in the front yard. Okay. So Phyllis has my flamenco dancer or oriental poppies developed a black gooey substance on the stem and buds. Some of the buds had the stems almost severed off. This happened almost overnight and she's had them for several years with no issues. Uh, most people that see the black gooey substance is the actual sap. That's the third stage or the color. So when it gets, the sap is starts out yellow, but as it ages, it turns black. So most of the time, I'd say 99% of the time when they're seeing a black gooey substance on a, on a poppy, that it's actually the sap. As far as being lopped off, I can tell you it's not a rabbit because it's poisonous to rabbits. That's the one thing that rabbits won't touch is, um, they know that, that, that if they eat a poppy, they'll die. So they generally don't lop it off. So I'm not sure what happened to your, to your poppies and why they got severed off. The only thing I can think is maybe they can eat the stems and not the, the bud set. I know the bud set kills them. Maybe they can eat the stems and not the buds and, and lop them off. That I don't have a great answer. But, um, and what causes it to get sap? It's hard to tell. Again, if something was nibbling on it or something was touching it, I'm sure it cut it and caused the sap in those poppies to, uh, to get all over it. It's the best answers I have on that one. Okay, BK, we have a vegetable garden and I've already planted tomatoes three times, but we're losing plants, including onions to some animal, vole or mole. We tried different things, including something at our nursery that didn't work um, and something else broke the top portion. You probably have voles. Um, I mean, it could be a mole, but voles tend to do the most damage in eating of all these rooted things. They'll eat, they'll eat anything, essentially. You don't hear about them eating tomatoes as much. Potatoes you do, um, <clears throat> onions you do. Uh, they do like stuff under the ground. The repellent's about the only thing that I had recommended you know, I talked to the, when Greg Sankin was running the park district, he had voles in his flower beds in a lot of different places. And I asked him what worked the best. And he said, switch to plants they don't like. That's a terrible thing to say when it comes to vegetables. But, um, you know, it's really voles. If, if vole repellent doesn't work, then it's, 
you're going to have some issues. We've had, again, great luck with the uh, Vol Scram and some of the other products for keeping them out, especially a garden where you can work it around the garden and on it or put it in there when you plant. Um, it seems to work well. That's the other thing is um, putting it, um, you know, putting it on the plant and, and below the plant seems to work pretty well. But voles are a tough beast, uh, a really tough beast, and they can do more damage than anything I know. So that's not a great answer, but uh, again, the, the scrams are about the only thing I have. Gretchen's got a great question. She's got a Tamukiyama Japanese maple. One side looks great and the other side's dead. Um, what can I do? That happens all the time, especially if you have it against uh, a fence or someone that gets something that gets heavily shaded it tends to knock out the backside of a, a plant. You also can have a side that takes a little bit more winter, a little bit more winter winds. When it comes to Japanese maples, it's not really the winter itself that kills them or is hard on them. It's the south sun that sits there and bakes the side. And then when it gets cold at night, it wreaks havoc on that side. So it doesn't like fluctuations in temperature. So when people say you want your <clears throat> maple protected, it's you're really protecting it from fluctuations in temperature, not from winds per se. How do you, when you have dead in it, there's really nothing else you can do besides um, cut out the dead. But here is a trick that we use. So a Japanese maple will grow these overlapping branches that fall. You, when you have fresh new growth, you can put a wire on them and turn them the other way and wire them in certain directions like you would do bonsai and have the new growth grow towards the side that's, that has a hole in it or that you've trimmed out and try and trim those branches or sorry, mold those branches or train those branches to cover up all the dead spots and get it back to that umbrella shape. And it is very doable because bonsai people do it all the time. They try and do a windswept where they make it all move in one direction where you can make them move the other direction. So you get a little copper wire, put it around it and bend it towards one direction and let that grow out and fill out. So there is ways <clears throat> to get back what you've lost, especially on the weeping forms of uh, Japanese maple like Tamukiyama, Red Dragon, um, Crimson Queen, all those. I can take four or five live branches and create a new plant out of it. I had to do the same thing with a weeping red bud. I lost most of my weeping red bud up front, but I trimmed my way out and trained my way out. And if you came and looked at it today, you couldn't tell that last year it was nothing of a tree. It looks beautiful this year. And that's just through taking what I've gotten and working with it and trying, uh, it's like the bald man here, uh, taking the hair and covering up the bad spot. It works the same when it comes to the Japanese maple. Uh, would it be possible to create water plants area on a deck? Absolutely. A big pot. There's nothing better than grabbing a big pot with no holes in it, filling with water, putting in a water lily, um, putting in some pond plants, a little fountain. It's a great, great thing to have in your deck. I'm not going to get into the fish thing. Some people put a little goldfish, but there's a lot of people that think that's terrible because the fish is eventually going to die. So I'll let you make that call, but as far as on your deck, having a little water garden, absolutely, I highly recommend. That's a great idea. It's fun, it's moving. And all you have to do is buy a big giant tub um, and then you put a water lily. And there's some water lilies that are made for little tubs that don't get super big. How do you get around of a groundhog? I don't I only know how to trap them. That's all I do is trap them and move them. I'm, I'm definitely not the groundhog guy. Um, I call in a specialist on the groundhog. Uh, what are the best plants for a shady front yard besides hosta? Um, we kind of went through that before. Uh, I'm a, a still be fan, a semisifuga plant fan. Um, Alchemilia mollis is a great one. Uh, geraniums, I love hardy geraniums to grow in that area. Uh, Virginia are fantastic. Um, Brunera are really good shade plants. Um, and again, there's some astilbe that I said before, but there's some called Mighty Quinn and Mighty Pip. They get four or five feet tall. So imagine that's almost like a shrub. Four feet, two feet, three feet wide, astilbe. As long as it gets enough water, it's fantastic. Um, 
Yeah, those all work. Lamiums, as I said earlier, too. Those work really well. What else we have? How to create a landscape for a front yard with a raised bed in the front shade area. Uh, raised beds are easy. All you have to do is build them and fill them with proper soil. The key is to make them look good in the front yard. Uh, it doesn't, and this is personal opinion, uh, putting a planter box in the front yard with, with a, out of a material that doesn't match your home doesn't look very good. Um, I'm not usually a person that says something looks bad. If you like your yard and you like your flowers, then more power to you. But there are some things that people put in their front yard that just doesn't work. Uh, a pool would be one of them. Uh, a raised bed can be one of them too. It's really meant more to be uh, in the backyard, but it is easy. Or you can build the front and put a facade. Maybe you put stone on it. Um, and you say you build a box out of wood and then you cover it with the stone up front. Uh, it's a little bit more costly, but it would match your decor a little bit better, but you would still get that perfect soil situation that you're looking for in a raised bed. Um, or if you are older and not as accessible, raised beds make sense. You don't have to bend over quite as far. Um, but I, like I said, I do like my front yard. I don't know. Maybe I'm just um, picky in that way. I like my front yard to match a little bit, not look like I just placed something there that didn't belong. Um, so I think it needs to be worked in, but you absolutely can put uh, a, a really nice raised bed. Mine is essentially, and my new design is a raised bed because I put boulders and raised it up two feet and filled it with soil. So that's a raised bed built out of boulders rather than a wood box. So you certainly can do it. Um, I don't know who put this, but th thank you for doing this. Uh, I moved into, oh, it's Corey. Uh, I just moved into a house that has a fairly large front tree lawn that is entirely shaded and has a ton of roots on the surface. I'd like to clean the area up, but we weren't, weren't sure what to put there. That's exactly what I have. It's tough. That tree will take everything you give those plants. They will steal. It will rob. It will make that situation super difficult. Um, hostas always seem to be, be fine. Um, Lamium and Lamiastrum were the two that I found. I pretty much had to go all Lamiastrum for um, most of the area with some hostas. The outside area of the trees, every single gap that I found, I put peony worked well and iris. I found the gaps of sun for that. Uh, I also had to cheat and put a rubber liner down over a smaller section of the tree and put dirt on top to keep the roots out of it for my annuals. Um, I know that's not ideal, but I couldn't find any other way to get like a 10 by four section. I knew it wasn't going to kill the tree because the tree has plenty of roots, but I just laid like a pond liner over it, built up a raised bed with these boulders that I'm talking about in stone and filled it with soil. And that lets my annuals and my flowers grow in there without their roots coming in. They are starting to find their way over the top of it. Um, but it still seems to work. I, you know, there was a point in time when I was planting a stilbies and I can't do it now because the tree's too big, but I was digging a hole, putting a Myers bag in the hole and then filling it with soil and planting the stilbies. So at least the water would retain in the plastic bags. Environmentally, not that great, but those trees are aggressive. So my, my ideal thing or my uh, idea for you would be Miami Astrum, um, fill in some, maybe even some pots inside the holes. Like that's the other thing I've done. I've dug a hole, put a pot in the ground and then put uh, planted plants in that pot to keep the maples from stealing from it. Um, mulch, a little bit of raised bed in there, pots. I got four pots under the trees. Provide some color, fill some space and uh, just kind of mixing it up under that tree. So that's kind of my ideas. Uh, Thomas, recommendations for eradicating miniature bamboo from the front, from the garden or yard. Uh, Champagne or bandit, it's illegal to plant spreading bamboo. Uh, if you have it, you're supposed to get a license saying that you already had it. And if you didn't do that, then you have to take it out. So how do you take it out? 
I dig it out the best I can, then I round it up from there. It's, um, again, not a big fan of roundup unless I have to, but you have to, um, but you, you just, you have to dig it up. And if it's gotten away from you, you're going to have to put a little roundup and just smoke it out and get rid of it and start over. And finally, um, what are the best houseplants to keep clean indoor air to support a healthy home? Are they easy to care for? Can you share advice? Uh, let's do that. So when it comes to houseplants, they're amazing. You have to have, if you don't have houseplants, you're not a plant lover. Uh, they do make a huge difference. They're the best furniture you can buy. They fill up space. They're beautiful. What are the plants that do the best job with the most foliage? Big ficus, anything with a ton of foliage does the most area. I, I was working with an environmental engineer coming up with something called oxygen points. And we were going to uh, put on every single plant at the nursery and house plants, um, how many oxygen points. So we would say that a human needed a hundred points of oxygen per day. And then on every plant, we were gonna say how many, at, after 10 years, how many points would that plant give you? So at 10 years growth, at 10 years size, what would it be? So a tree might be 10 and a plant might be two. And when our formula and we were calculating everything, it really comes down to the amount of leaves. How many, how much do leaves breathe and how much oxygen do they clean or you know, provide? Uh, it's based on the amount of foliage. So get plants with as much foliage as you can to get the best uh, cleanliness. You do got to dust them. They pick up a lot of dust as well. But I've had my plants for 25 years and we're fi finally seeing a couple that look pretty rough. But uh, we've had 10 house plants here that are five feet tall for 25 years. So that's a pretty good run for a house plant. Uh, and the last question from the same person, can you share advice on how to get a backyard garden started? I use a simple one. I'm, a, I'm usually a third compost, a third peat moss or a peat based planting mix and a third topsoil. And I mix those all together. Everybody's got a different mix, but that's the mix that I go with. Um, like lots of compost, mushroom compost is good. Plant based compost. Um, recycling center compost is pretty good, but you might want something that's a little richer, a little bit more plant based or a little bit mushroom compost based uh, mixed in there as well. And that'll get her done. It'll be the perfect mixture. All right, those are the questions they're giving me before. Hope I didn't uh, take up too much time. No, Shane, you did great. Thank you very much. All right, thank you again very much, and good night, everybody. Thanks, Shane. It was awesome. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Have a great evening. Bye bye.